I'm Kayla. And I'm Haley. And we majored in English for it. This week, we read Sandry's book by Tamara Pierce, the first book in all of the Circle books, but primarily the first book in uh, the Circle of Magic Quartet. My children! I, I love know. them! I love them so much. Like, okay, so there's this book series, which is uh, the Circle of Magic Quartet. Then there's the sequel series, which is the Circle Opens, also about these four. Nice. And then there's the Circle Reforged, and I think there's only three books in that one so far. So She's far? Like, yeah, she has put dude, she hasn't put <laughs> out any new books in um the the circle books in the last ten years, but I've been on her website. I know she's up to some stuff. She has <laughs> thoughts and feelings still. She's just been working on Tortal stuff. Yeah. Cause like the new mare books are still coming out, right? You, uh, yeah, there's only one of them coming out. And then when we were in college, she was doing the Becca Cooper books, which were like prequels about George Cooper's uh, like, Ancestor. Okay. <laughs> cool. <laughs> George Cooper was uh, Alana the Lion as his husband. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. And in his youth, he was the King of Thieves in the capital city. Nice. Um, but yeah, so I know she still has some plans about stuff that's happening. Um, but yeah, this book came out sometime in 1997. Nice. Couldn't find a release date. Um, but, My book said yeah. 98, but I could have had, like, a later one. A yeah. later printing. It is. Oh, what was the cover of yours? What was going on in the cover? It was... I, th I don't have it with me, but I think it was... It was Sandry and Briar on... No, mine was just Sandry on the roof was with it her spindle. Just her on the roof. Yeah. Yeah, that's the one... I think that's, like, the current cover. The first time I read it, it was the other cover... Um that <laughs> let me look look it up it's like there's two people on okay there's multiple versions of this first book i'm so shocked. did you have the one um yeah so you just had the one where it was on, her on the roof by herself do yeah and then the i also listened to the audiobook for some of it and it the, that one was her and briar on the roof on the roof yeah, yeah. Yeah, the first time I read on that, this is, I don't understand why all of her books have multiple covers. <laughs> Maybe because they started out so awful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. So, yeah, so I couldn't remember exactly when I read this for the first time. The only way I could, like, decipher it is remembering um, the way that Nico teaches them how to meditate. Nice. Was I remember, like, trying to do that while laying in my bed, and I, like, remembered specifically how my room was set up. So I uh -huh. think I read these in either my freshman or sophomore year of high school. Nice. Yeah. So I had read all the Tortal books that were out, and then I started these books. Because I was like, well, I've exhausted uh, all my other options. You know, I read, uh, what, uh, 4, 4, 4, 12, plus 2, 14 books. And I was like, might as well read this 14 book series. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> but... So she only has Circle of Magic books and the Tortal books, or is, does she have yeah. a third world universe? No, these are the two main roles she dabbles, dabbles around in. Nice. I haven't, I've only read the four that we read for, mm -hmm. uh, shit, I already forgot what it's called. The, uh, the, the Immortals Quartet. Yeah, I, so I've only read those, but I think that I might like this one, this world better. I don't know. Yeah, because it's not like traditional, like high fantasy yeah it's a, it's much more like domestic i guess like they're just yeah. they're just making a cute little family together and i love it we love found families <laughs> um yeah so what was i gonna say yeah i really liked a lot about this book series i feel like this is like tamara pierce's bread and butter mm -hmm. is this kind of stuff yeah so, uh, yeah, I'm going to crack my soda open. 
Nice. <laughs> also, as well, you can tell she's a much more experienced writer in this, I felt like. I agree. It's not like there was less just weird shit if that like as far as like dialogue and description yeah. and stuff like it was I don't want to say easier because they're both middle grade <laughs> fiction series but yeah. like it was just more I guess contemporary at least in the language I yeah feel like so that's what I'm she, trying this to say. so she this book came out she started writing these books right after the Immortals Quartet. So she had Ooh. eight books under her belt. And I think you can definitely see a lot of stuff that we saw in the Immortals Quartet coming through. Yeah, um, for sure. The way she discusses magic and how it moves and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because the next series in the Tortal books, Protector of the Small, they didn't start coming out until 1999. Gotcha. So I guess really she was writing these like at the exact same time. Her mind. Her mind. She's <laughs> only sixty five years old. What? Yeah. She she was the narrator of the audiobook that I listened to. And oh, it was a was... full cast. It was oh my so God. good. I've, I've never heard her voice. It is not what you would expect it to sound like. At least not what I expected it to sound like. Is it like high pitch? No. <sighs> I either expect her to have, like, a gravelly voice or, like, a high-pitched voice. It's sort of gravelly. I'm trying to think there's an actress that it reminded me so much of, and I kept thinking it was that actress. Ah, no, 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 no. Who plays... Who voices... Oh, give me a minute. Give me a minute. (laughs) But you can keep going. I'll look this up. Yeah, I I was just looking up her... Uh, her works. Um. Oh, Mrs. Incredible. Who voices Mrs. Incredible? Oh, Mrs. Incredible. Oh, she sounds like that. Kind Mrs. of. Incredible. Uh, that's uh, it's it's. Holly Hunter. Holly Hunter. If anyone like, if anyone else has like <laughs> listened to both of those, they're gonna be like, "What the fuck?" But that was kept, who I kept hearing. She has like just these little like vocal quirks that just are just like Holly Hunter. Oh wow! I did not know. Now I'm very interested in the audiobooks. You should read like. If I, I would have liked this book, but if I hadn't also listened to the audiobook for some of it, I don't know if I would have liked it as much, because it was just so good with all, like, the little characters, voices, and, uh, Oh, I, yeah, I might just track down the audiobook, just so I can listen to who they cast as what voices. It's pretty good. It's pretty okay. good. So the nostalgia factor for me was just, like, because I remember, okay, so these books mean so much to me because I wrote, um, when we were applying for colleges, I applied to two colleges, Illinois State University and Illinois College. And at Illinois College, the, uh, entrance essay that you write, one of the prompts is pick a fictional character. I wrote about Triss. That's who I wrote about because I felt like very, I feel very akin to her. Like she, I really wanted red hair at the time. (laughs) Uh, Of course, because my hair is still red to this day. I was overweight. I had anger issues and it was just like, because her story is very much about her, like figuring out who she is Mm -hmm. and what it means to have all this power and all that jazz and it's just so cool but yeah and I got a $68,000 scholarship that I did not go to that school nice (sighs) so I was just very nostalgic for like just like how and also because I know like what they end up all going through (laughs) yeah do not tell me one single thing like it gets rough for Roni for them. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Like I started Triss's book, and it's already mm-hmm. like, what the fuck's going on? Yeah, because I they're like, I think they're like supposed to be eleven in this book. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. And then by like the last book that's currently out in the series, they're like twenty something. Oh. Yeah. For some reason, in this book, I was picturing them like seven. 
eight. I don't know why. They're just so, like, goofy little a, kids. I don't know. A ten-year-old might as well be a seven-year-old. That's true. <laughs> okay. So, let's get into what happened here. So, there's going to be a lot of quotes at the beginning just because I got to tell you stuff. Okay, so sure. our opening lines. Uh, in the Palace of Black Swan, Zakid, Zakedin, Zakdin. Oh my god. <laughs> Capital of Fatar, blue eyes wide, Lady Sandraline Fatorin watched her near empty oil lamp. Her small mouth quivered as the flame at the end of the wick din danced and shrank, throwing grim shadows on the barrels of food and water that shared her prison. When the flame was gone, she would be without light in this windowless storeroom. I'll go crazy, she said flatly. When they come to rescue me, I'll be raving mad. She refused to admit that with this room locked from the outside and hid by magic, a rescue was hopeless. Uh. Sandry's, yeah, so Sandry's locked in this room because smallpox <sighs> is ravaging the city as well like as a, an angry mob. I couldn't um, figure it out, but okay. That's good. I don't know. Sandry knows that the traitor wizards uh, can catch wind in the nets, and she's trying to catch light in her embroidery. Gathering the ends of the threads in her left hand, she pulled them together in a knot, tying it as snugly as she could. Finding long dressmaker pins in her basket, she pinned the knot to a barrel to anchor it. Her fingers shook, sweat crawled down her face. She didn't want to think of what happened if this didn't work. Worse, there was no reason for it to work. Piracy, the traitor and servant, had magic. Lady Sandraline Fatorin was good only to be waited on and to marry. Uh, but somehow it works, and the threads start to light up. Now we hop POVs. Just right off the bat, I love like I love this start because it is it's so immersive, but it's not mm -hmm. like it doesn't like it's. What am I trying to say? It like it all like it makes sense. Like you can picture it's the storeroom and the mm -hmm. darkness, and like you can mm -hmm. start getting like a sense of the world, but it's not like. You know everything. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not yeah. expositional by any means. Yeah, and the POV hopping was not jarring at all for No, me. definitely like, not. usually it is. It blends very well, so. Absolutely. In the southeastern pebbled sea, when she sat up and looked at herself, Daja thought she was a ghost. Her skin was all sparkly white. Had an enemy memander turned her from a brown traitor into a white one? Why on earth would anyone do such a thing? She ran her swollen tongue over cracked lips and tasted salt and grimaced at her foolishness. This was no memander's doing. It was it happened when a sea-soaked girl went to sleep and didn't wake until the sun was high overhead? She brushed herself off, salt flakes dropping onto her makeshift raft. Right, white grains got into her many cuts and scrapes where they burned like fire fire her family ship was gone sunk in a storm that their meander could not stop or get rid of the traitor god coma known for peculiar acts had chosen daja to be the only one left alive floating on a square wooden hatch overhead this is so interesting that line was so interesting to me because of what happens later so like she says like in daja's point of view like the god chose her to be the only one that lives, and then the, like, ruling party of the traitors are like, mm -hmm. you are bad luck because you survived when everyone else died. Like, it's just funny. Yeah. It's just interesting. So, is her name pronounced Daja, or is it Deja? I've been saying Daja. Okay, I think, it, I think it's Daja, so... Daja, I love Daja so much. <laughs> okay, so a survival box floats by Daja, and she commands it to come to her, and it does. Against the odds. And with the box, she survives for three days and sees no shines of ships. And then Nico Golden, Goldeye uh, arrives and saves her. POV hop. Um, and Harja, port city is so tapped. The first time the Harjan street guard caught Roach with a hand on someone else's purse, they tattooed an X on the web of skin between his right thumb and forefinger, then tossed him into a big holding cell overnight. Nursing his sore hand, Roach went straight to the far edge of the chamber, where a watery beam of sunshine reached down from the opening in the wall. Patches of cushiony moss grew there. Sitting on the floor, Roach found that one of them made a fine pillow. Months later, a shopkeep grabbed Roach as the boy helped himself to a few scarves. The Harjan street guard took him, tattooed on the X of the web of his left hand, and tossed him into the same holding cell. 
The moss had grown to cover most of a corner. It made a soft couch where he could sleep and wait to be released in the morning. Roach's current visit was his third. The guard had nabbed his entire gang of street rats in a jeweler's shop. Most of them already had two exes, which means they got no third release from justice. I so, immediately loved him. Like, I just, I loved him immediately. Oh. I know. Oh my god. <laughs> so it's judging time and Roach thanks the moss and he goes. He thinks of the moss and how he loves plants during the judging. And then he's stopped and his hands examined again. You have a choice of docks or apprenticeship of the winding circle temple in Emmeline, the judge went on, until you take formal vows of the temple or until its governing council rules that you are fit to enter society. Temple or docks boy, choose choose there were guards on the docks nasty wary fellows what temple would hang onto a smart rat like him better yet emmeline was far to the north of satat fresh territory where no one knew who he was temple he replied <laughs> um, so nico goldeye has found him as well and roach picks a new name for himself briar moss how he picks his name is so cute he's like what are those things with the thorns they're called briars okay that's my name now and your last name? Uh, what use is a last name? Moss, I guess. <laughs> and then our fourth. In the city of Nenvier and Capchen, in the darkness of the temple t dormitory, she was trying to cry herself to sleep with the least amount of noise. Trisana Chandler heard voices. It wasn't the first time she'd done so, but these voices were different. This time, she could identify the speakers. They sounded exactly like the girls who shared the dormitory with her. I heard her very own parents brought her here and dropped her off and said they never wanted to see her again. <laughs> Tris. God. My girl. I, uh, like, I can't pick a favorite among them. I love them all I so know. much. <laughs> they all have, like, they're different, like, things. Like, Sandry, oh, Sandry, I love you so much. And then Tris, her spirit... Daja Briar, my problematic face. <laughs> He's not problematic, but He's just a little troublemaker, it's fine. He's our little thief boy. So <laughs> Triss is extremely bullied and has been passed around her family, and she, when she gets upset, the wind begins to blow and tear into the dormitory and destroy every girl's bed but hers. <sighs> so they're sending her away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nico Goldeye just happens to be passing through Stone Circle Temple. Uh, and she so, was supposedly tested for magic once, but nothing came up. And they think that she might be possessed or something. Nico's like, okay, I'll take her to Winding Circle. And Tris says he'll regret it. <laughs> uh, back in Sandry's storeroom, she's still braiding and winding thread to keep the light. And then Nico finds her. Yeah. Yeah. Now, four months later in Summer Sea and Emelyn, Sandry's great uncle, the Duke, is the ruler of Emelyn, and Nico has brought her to him. Sandry wants to stay with her great uncle, but his castle is no place for children. Nico offers for Sandry to stay at the Winding Circle, which just happens to also be in Emelyn. <laughs> uh, Daja awaits her fate after the shipwreck for traitors, um, lone survivors, or bad luck, and she is made an outcast and must bear the trunk she staffed. Blank and alone, now like her. She's forbidden to speak, touch, or write to any other traitors. And Nico takes her to the Winding Circle Temple. So Briar and Nico are making their way to Emmeline, and he's forced into a bath. <laughs> um, Briar wants to leave Nico, but Nico just mentions the gardens at Winding Circle, and Briar is oh so tempted to stay and to see them just once, and then he'll go. He says. <laughs> So Nico and Triss are on their way together, and Triss learns of weather magic stored in knots. And Triss is annoyed that Nico won't tell her anything or ask her about magic. Nico says he doesn't want to somehow shape her decisions, and she needs to figure things out herself. She gets mad at him and runs to the dock and loves to be under the open sky. And Rumo's fire, the fire of the god, comes down and touches her, and she's so happy and giddy. And Nico watches and tells her that she deserves more than she's been given, and she will find it at Winding Circle Temple. Oh, Nico. Uh, so Sandry has been at Winding Circle uh, for eight weeks and despises all the other nobles there. <laughs> uh, 
And then they start making fun of Daja, who's just arrived. And Sandri is just like, that's it. Screw these bitches. And invites Daja to sit with her and talk to and talks to her and traitor. This quote. Do you already know what this quote is? Of course you do. Lady Daja is my guest, Sandri told Lisa. <laughs> a girl number nearby muttered, if that's a lady, I'm a cat. Reaching out, Sandri lifted the pitcher of milk from the table. Cradling it in both hands, she walked over to mutter. I, Sandrilene Fauturin, daughter of Count Matin Fauturin, and his countess, Emilienne Falandrig, I am the great niece of his grace, Duke Vidris of this realm of Emelin, and cousin of her imperial highness, Empress Berene of the Namorne Empire. You are Esmel a Pregan, daughter of Baron Witten in Pregan, and his lady, Colidia of House Wheelwright, a merchant house. If I tell you my friend is a lady, then you... She carefully poured milk into Esmeralda's plate. Had better start laughing, Kitty. She set the pitcher down and returned to her chair. <laughs> what? So Sandry. baller. She's Sandry. so <laughs> badass, dude. In, like, her own cute little ladylike way. Where she's just like, um, first of all, I'm literally... Uh, on multiple th lines of succession right now. Shut <laughs> up, you merchant. <laughs> like, uh. um, my grandfather was the emperor of, it, <laughs> of, of the morn. My, uh, great uncle is the Duke of Emmeline, and I'm technically a countess in my own right at the moment. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so good. Yeah. So, uh, Dedicate it, dedic, dedic, dedicate, 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 yeah, dedicate, <laughs> dedicate, staghorn is rude to Triss, and Triss Loki causes an earthquake, or at least senses that it's coming. At first I thought she caused it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I Triss thought so too, but like, as the story went on, I got the, like, I feel like I realize that like they're happening they've been happening maybe or something like yeah that, that she just sends them <gasps> yeah so uh trish is sure she's gonna get kicked out again uh daja's walking around the temple and she's thinking about her interest in metalwork and when she's attacked and like um a hate crime um <laughs> nico and dedicate um superior moonstream stop the shitheads and they're gonna move daja to the cottage that is safe Safer on the grounds, named Discipline. Uh, Briar isn't having much luck so far at the temple either. The rich boys are giving him trouble and going through his things and ruining his stash of dried plants. He also has some knives that he should have. <laughs> <laughs> and he gets in trouble. And he's also moved to Discipline Cottage. So, Triss is uh, awaiting her own disciplinary hearing. Um, she watches as a small tree is struck by lightning. And he goes like, hmm, that's strange. <laughs> <laughs> and goes in to meet with Moonstream. Then, another dedicate drags in Sandry, who doesn't want her in her dorm either. <laughs> Triss thinks uh, Sandry must be stuck up. But Sandry is just Sandry. Um, they are both being moved to Discipline Cottage. Nico says that he thought they would settle better in the main buildings. Tr Sandry says she's been trying. Trish says she doesn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> As they make their way to Discipline Cottage, uh, Trish senses another quake. When they get there, Briar, Briar and Daja are already there. Dedicate Lark arrives and greets Nico and the girls. Her and Dedicate Rose Thorn uh, run Discipline Cottage together. And this, I'm just telling you this now, Haley, because it does not become explicitly canon until much, much later. Uh, I'm informing you that Rose Thorn are and Lark are lesbians and are in love with each other. Yes! I like, knew it! I didn't know it, obviously, but yes! I love I think, that. I Actually, I know that they are together, but I think either Rose Thorn or Lark, I think Rose Thorn is a lesbian, but Lark is bisexual. I love that. They're so good together. Yeah, I remember reading that uh, uh, Pierce, she was like mulling it over for a long time before she was like, you know what? Fuck it. Might as well. <laughs> and there's some other stuff that goes on with sexualities with these characters, with our main four later. Alright. Okay, so the girls are picking out rooms, and God, this moment of Nico admonishing Briar for his knives. He's like, 
Knives, Briar. Knives. <laughs> uh, so Sanjay really hopes that Lark lets her learn how to weave and won't punish her, punish her for her interest in needlework. Trish and Daja choose rooms on the top level, and Trish can't wait to be at the heart of a storm should one eventually pass. <laughs> Uh, the kids are exchanging language and culture. Sandry is fascinated by Briar's slang. And Briar can talk some traitor talk. And Daja warns Sandry that he's a thief twice over. <laughs> um, Briar fetches Rosorn, who's a stone cold bitch. And I love her so much. She is a stone cold bitch, but like to other people and not <laughs> and only like in a nice way to like the kids and Lark and Nico. Yeah, she is not to be trifled with. <laughs> so, uh Briar can't find Rosethorn at first and he gets entranced by some plants and helps the vines grow and move when Rosethorn finds them. He's like all trapped in their little vines. <laughs> and she lets them them out and he knows she knows something is up with him and plants. Mhm. Mm they have lunch. Nico invites uh, to take Trista library with him the next day. Briar is interested in the greenhouses. And then they all learn that Nico's a mage. <laughs> <laughs> How is that not apparent? I don't understand. I don't know. <laughs> Rose Thorn uh, lays down the law and says, stay out of her way. Lark is in charge. <laughs> 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 that night, Tris hears voices on the winds. Uh, Sandra comes to talk to her and offers her one of the wall hangings that she made. And Tris is like, you forget yourself, my lady, and calls out the classes in between them. But she keeps the wall hanging. Sandra's just trying to be nice. Yeah. Um, Sandra tells Daja that she will befriend who she pleases, and she has plenty of friends who are traitor folk or common folk. She oh, Because she couldn't be friends with noble kids for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> well, because, like, her parents traveled around so much, so she... Yeah. Oh, I don't think we find that out till later. Sorry. I think this... No, this is right when that happens. It's why they weren't home when they died. Ooh. So, Ooh. Daja goes on a walk and comes back... Comes across the blacksmith, and he is hard at work. He is dedicated Frostpine. She stays and helps him. Frostpine! Frostpine. Also, I will tell you now, there's no weird teacher-student relationship stuff that happens in these series. Not at all? Not at all. Oh, thank God. Happens. You do not have to oh worry. Oh my gosh. I, I didn't know when I was going to bring it up, but like, I loved <laughs> everything so much, and I was like, if this is fucking ruined by some Dana New Mare shit, I'm rioting. I do not want that to happen. No, no. It's oh, all thank just God. Uh, parental affection. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> yeah, so Nico fetches Triss and he takes her to a cave and shows her how to meditate. She needs to get a handle on her emotions to control her powers, and she knows it as well. So she does, and this description of magic is like so good i didn't highlight it but like the way like they describe like how she moves with her magic mm -hmm. it's very remis reminiscent of like dane and her how she thinks of her magic yeah i i really like the i'll talk about it when we talk about magic never mind no you can talk about it here if you want just how like i love her description of like the magic system it just seems so like and i don't know if that's um because of the magic that our kids have or because of mm -hmm. just like the whole this whole realm how they deal with magic but like it just seems so like natural and intuitive and like mm -hmm. i don't know like it doesn't need too much explaining you just like feel it out for yourself i just i love that kind of magic system yeah. where it's not like you have to do this at this time and this will happen so yeah and then later on frostbite even explains there is traditional magic but traditional magic like spells and potions isn't necessary for life while the magic that they ha all have is necessary for life yeah definitely i yeah. love that so briar runs an errand for lark on his way back he stops at the greenhouses and he sees a sad tree but before <laughs> he can investigate he is stopped by two dedicates and are and uh they're like, huh, from Rosehorn, huh, a spy. And then he eats <laughs> on out. <laughs> Before Sandy, this, uh, we got, like, a little snippet, a little taste of Rosethorn's feelings for Crane, right? She, she's anti-greenhouse. Yeah, because, like, 
the plants have their season and you shouldn't try to force yeah. them out of their seasons. Yeah. So Sandry pokes around in Lark's workroom and Lark teaches her about fibers and how to spin and Sandry feels alive. <laughs> She's just like, they told me I'm too into needlework. <laughs> <laughs> at dinner Briar mentions the sick tree to Rosehorn she says it might be dying and he should show it to her sometime Lark tells them their new schedules cleaning meditating learning bathing and sleeping so <laughs> they're going to the bath the baths and Briar is resistant and they're just like boy if you don't take a bath right now if I keep bathing so much I'll catch my death <laughs> and Rosehorn is just like or you'll just get stinky <laughs> <laughs> or when uh, when they force when Nico forces Briar into the bath the first time he's like that's why you're so skinny you bathe all the time. <laughs> oh or when my Nico's god! Nico's just like Nico has to get four grown men to help him <laughs> shove Briar into the bathtub and he's just like if I have to hire people to put you into a bath time, um, there's less money for food so maybe you should get in the bath on your own. <laughs> Briar's like oh maybe I should. Maybe I should try this bathing thing. <laughs> <laughs> so Dodge and Tris are le so they all get there, and it turns out it's just like one big like <laughs> bathtub. <laughs> it's a it's a public bath basically, and Dodge and Tris are just like, uh, no, not gonna do that. And Sandra just like, I've done worse. <laughs> <laughs> and so Rose Thorn takes the other two to the private bathtubs. And the next morning at breakfast, Sandry puts honey and milk in Briar's porridge and says he needs the sweetening. <laughs> and he thinks twice about yelling at her because something tells him she gives as good as she gets. <laughs> uh, Rose Horn explains why she doesn't like Crane. She thinks rooming houses are a trick that, and that plants need to rest for two seasons, not just keep going. After chores, they go meet Nico at the hub, the center of Winding Circle. On the way, the bullies from Briar's old dorm room pass by and start talking shit, and Tris gets a little electric with them, <laughs> but they drag her off before she loses control. Uh, Nico meets up with them and takes them to the stairs in the hub. The stairs are spelled to keep out any and all magic, there, so there isn't any, like, wire crossing from the different areas in the mm -hmm. hub. It's the best place for meditation, he says. Why, Sandry wanted to know, we'd be more comfortable with the discipline. Today, we sacrifice comfort for security, replied Nico. Every creature has magic, even it's just the magic of life. In meditation, you open your mind. Any magic you have spills out. By learning to concentrate here, any magic you release will stay here without affecting anyone else. What's magic got to do with me, demanded Briar. If I have any, it don't bother me. Dodge nodded. Sandry and Tris both looked troubled. It's all very well and good, my boy, Nico said dryly. But have you ever thought that you might bother magic? <laughs> <laughs> so they begin to meditate. Nico was talking quietly, explaining how they must pull their minds from the entire staircase into something small. That was easy for the boy. Right away in front of him, someone had fitted a mini petaled rose into the carving. Shutting his eyes, Briar felt the change physically as he sank into the rose, petal by petal. Sandry placed herself in the wood fed to a drop spindle. Feeling herself grow tight and thin and long, she spun herself into thread. Daja squeezed in the rounded striking surface of a fuller and locked her mind on the warmth of the hammering cherry red iron. Once again, Tress made herself into a rope of wind. Yeah. So, These kids think they don't have magic. <laughs> yeah. My cat was just biting a wall. Um, I'm trying to huh. stop this. Get, that seems rather difficult. Stop biting the wall. <laughs> Maybe there's a mouse inside. Nico takes them on a tour of the hub afterwards. He, they go and see the heart fires, which is the center of Winding Circle. Once a meteor came and made a, the, a great crater that the Winding Circle now sits in. And, and, it hold, and it, there's all this magic that holds the city together. Nico shows them the initiates, the ones who hear voices on the wind. And Triss realizes she isn't crazy. The others can't hear voices on the wind as well. And he lets them go at midday to practice their meditation. Nico tra tells Triss he'll come fetch her later in the day. Briar climbs onto the roof, and the sick tree keeps bothering him, but he knows he shouldn't interfere. <laughs> um, Triss climbs up on the roof as well, and Briar tells her to leave, and she's like, okay. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so the two meditate on the roof together, and Tris shows him the storm brewing in the bay. And then Rosehorn gets him to help prepare the garden for the rain. Sandry is helping Lark pull wool, but it won't work. The fibers like her too much. <laughs> so L L Lark teaches her how to command the fibers. Nico comes uh, for Triss as the storm starts to settle over the temple. Nico tells Triss to predict where the lightning will strike and that it will help in controlling her powers so that she doesn't one day accidentally hurt someone. She wants nature to bend to her and not to bend to nature. She wants to be called Storm Killer one day. <laughs> <laughs> so badass. <gasps> yeah. So Daja goes to the forge um, the next day. And Frostpine is working in the goldsmith. She helps him. He sh shows her the hard way of goldsmithing and then the easy way when he pours his magic oh. into it. Frostpine lets Daja pull the gold and it feels just so right and natural to her. Uh, Frostpine offers to let her apprentice with him and Daja feels so guilty because even if she is an outcast, she w shouldn't want to do this because she's supposed to be a traitor even if she's outcast from being a traitor. Uh, Traitors she don't does. do. They only trade. Yeah. But she, oh, does she want an apprentice with Frostpine? So mm -hmm. she's like, you know what? I'm gonna. And Lark and Rose don't approve as well. And they get new clothes for her to wear in the forges and Lark makes her a headband and an armband to wear for Aww. her mourning. Uh, Lark tells Daja that, Daja that she lived with traitors once and was an acrobat in a life before the temple. And she cartwheels away! <laughs> <laughs> the fact that she's also wearing, like, a full habit. I she's... know! She's so awesome. Yeah. So Triss wakes in the morning to a voice on the wind. Briar is in trouble. <laughs> Triss and Sandry run out to see Briar running back with something cradled in his arms. He stole the dying tree to bring it to Rosethorn. And Crane is pissed. <laughs> Briar begs to keep the tree and Rosethorn is going to make, uh, it's going to trade a tomato plant for it because tomatoes are not common. <laughs> Uh, Cr and, but Crane, he isn't having it. Uh, after the two have it out, Rosehorn tells Briar that if he wants a tree, he has to take care of, take care of it. It's called a Shacken tree, and it's basically just a fantasy version of a bonsai tree. Yeah. Side note, yeah. Seth has three bonsai trees that he's acquired in the last three months, so I know all about these damn bonsais. <laughs> 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 he just stares at them all the time. God. <laughs> Um, Triss tries to, uh, Triss does teach Briar how to dust, and they all meditate with Nico, Lark, and Rosethorn, and Nico says they've made progress. Sandra decides she is done with her morning clothes and puts on her old clothes again and joins Daja and Triss on the roof. They all talk. It's good times. Mm -hmm. Triss is going to meditate more with Nico, way more than the others have to because she has some emotional issues. Yeah, and like her, I feel like her power is the only one that's like, Dangerous. <laughs> yeah. So Rose Thorn teaches Briar how to take care of the shocking trees and sends him to get a new get a new pot for it. Sandry isn't quite getting the hang of spinning or spinning magic, so she can't really spin yarn or spin magic into her yarn. Um Yeah. So Lark is making her take more breaks. Briar has the shock and tree all set up. He learns the differences between bad hurt and good hurt, and while pruning hurts, it is necessary. In the forges, Daja is learning smithing, and she picks up red hot metal with her bare hands, and it doesn't <laughs> burn her. It turns out it doesn't burn Frostpine either. Kirill, Frostpine's current uh, apprentice, is, just runs out. He's like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. Yeah, so the next day they all go to the Summer Sea Market. They get five coppers each and are off. And then Sandry gets in a street fight. <laughs> <laughs> when she sees some bullies tormenting a dog and then Daja joins in and then Briar joins in Triss is terrified to help scared she will get hurt and then she uses her magic she draws up a water spout and it pours all through the alleyway and then Triss can't get it to stop and Daja and Sandry lend her strength while Briar gets Lark and Rose Thorn and Lark is able to stop the cyclone they're about to leave when the boys that they were fighting in the street, their parents all show up all mad, and Sandry tries arguing with him, and then who rolls onto the scene but Nico Goldeye and the Duke, you know, Sandry's scary uncle. <laughs> and they're just like, huh, hmm, hmm. 
<laughs> and it's like this like battle of the wills in in the square and then the kids find out they're all mage they all find out right now that they're actually all mages in training <laughs> and they're all just like sharply looking at Nico like excuse me <laughs> what did you say yeah anyways this is all basically resolved in no money and exchanging hands but Triss isn't allowed to leave winding circle until she has her powers under control they also get to keep the dog. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Briar is adamant to Rosor that he is not a mage, and she's like, oh, you sweet boy. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely are. Uh, the kids exchange their experiences with magic and realizes, just maybe, just maybe, they are mages. <laughs> <laughs> they all go back to Winding Circle, and the Duke is guiding them. The Duke tells Sandry he is proud of her, and he says he is sure that her parents would be proud of her, too, and that her magic makes her special. Oh. And then another earthquake hits. <laughs> uh, the four kids corner Nico when they get back and is and make him spill the beans. He doesn't tell them about he didn't tell them about their magic because he wanted them to grow into it first. No one else could detect their magic because their magic does not present itself like traditional mages, which is why they're a winding circle and not a university. Yeah. Yeah, so Daja's super na- anxious the next day to get to the forge, and Frostbine explains the magic to her. Um, here it is. This odd power that I have, that you have, is not like that of the university mages. They draw a design on the ground, mumble a few words, and get results. Not us. Our magic only works as well as the things it passes through. You can't bring a forge to white heat, a forge fire to white heat with a bellows, or work an iron bar so it won't break on impact, or melt down ores without removing the dross. You shrugged. Magic is only as strong as your fire or metal. It's only as pure as the ore you melt down. Before you become a mage, you must be a smith. You must work both metal and magic together. I really liked also how Nico described it. He was like, there, it's more of like, I was kind of saying this earlier, but it's more of like a natural form of magic almost, where like, yeah. it's like the the everyday kind of stuff that yeah. everyone needs. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So, Frostbine gives her an exercise against the metals without touching them. She aces it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the night That night, they all sit quietly together and Briar asks Lark to teach him how to spin, and Trish and Daja wish to learn as well. Their lives fall into routine after that. One day, they're on the roof comparing lessons, and they're such good friends, and it's only book one! It's so cute. Briar is always sneaking off for more food, and this was, like, a highlighted note in my Kindle. You know how it does sometimes? (laughs) Yeah. One thing is certain. Hunger is a thing of the past. You may skip a meal or two, but you'll never starve. Take my word for that, and don't make me ever come after you again. (laughs) <laughs> Suddenly, Briar wrapped his arms around Rose Thorn and squeezed and let go. Then, off towards discipline, Rose Thorn, her cheeks red, followed him. Oh, you love to see it! It's all so pure. Oh my god! <laughs> so Triss wakes up and decides she's gonna fight the ocean tide, and the tide <laughs> wins. And he goes like, "This is why we don't fight fight nature, Triss." And then gives her a whole book about. <laughs> <laughs> about why she shouldn't try to fight nature. Then another earthquake comes that afternoon, and Trish is still drained of all her energy. She saves the shock and tree from being destroyed. I almost cried. She's like, she's like limping over there, crawling on the ground, and catches it just in time, and then Briar yeah. comes and is like, thank you for saving my tree. Ah! It's so cute. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so then something is coming to the pebbled sea, and Nico has to prepare for it. The next few weeks are tense and rushed. A major earthquake is coming, and they all have to prepare for it. Uh, Sandry has a nightmare of the pox and her parents' death, and then during that day, it all feels so wrong for everyone, because the quake is coming. The dog, Little Bear... Uh, runs off into a cave and they chase after him. Uh, they go very deep into this cave, like extremely underground. And then the quake hits and they're trapped in the cave and in the dark. And Sandry is having a panic attack. 
Uh, Dodge is holding up the roof with her back, and Tru uses her raw magic to make them a barrier, and Triss makes an air vent to give them air, and Daja and Briar force the coal to solidify and not crumble around them. Triss says another quake is coming, but it's not a normal one. It's a magic one, and their barrier might not hold. So then they combine their magic together in a circle to protect them. Briar pulls magic from the shocking tree. Daja pulls from the iron core around them. Triss pulls from the lava below. And they spin, and then uh, Sandry has like her magic thread with her, and they then they spin all these barrier plants and wire together to ride out the rest of the quake. And then Rose Thorn, Frostpine, and Moonstream save them. Somehow they're in the center fire in the hub. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure how that happened. Did they just like bust out into that? I I didn't know either. I thought maybe they like when they were looking for Little Bear, they like got that far into it. I wasn't sure. Yeah, I wasn't sure either. But somehow they're the center fire in the hub. The four are now magically connected, and eventually they're all out home and start putting things to rights. And Triss decides she's going to make a light candle for Sandry so she'll never be in the dark again. And Dodger and Briar also help form the light. And then Triss offers to teach Briar how to read. And I have a quote. So you never have to worry about the dark again, explained Triss. Briar tossed her a small leather pouch. See, if you put it in there, it doesn't look show. It doesn't show. You can hang it around your neck. Sandry, voiceless, took the crystal, holding it up before her eyes. Crystals can be spelled and hold power for a long time, Triss explained. We figure, we hope, Daja corrected, we hope that by the time the power leaves the crystal, you won't be afraid of the dark anymore, Briar explained. Sandry's eyes filled and spilled over. Thank you, she said. I couldn't ask for better friends. Don't get all sloppy on us, retorted Briar. Girls. <laughs> Little Bear barked sharply. They had paid enough attention to their light and to Sandry. Now they could pet him. Obedient to his orders, Daja scratched his ears and Triss his rump. The end. I cried. I cried. It is so... It's so nice. It's yeah. just so cute. We love a found family. <sighs> Adorable. Yeah. Um. Let's talk about love. They're ten. We're moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Theme park. Friendship is a circle. You're yeah. not in this alone. I the think, wheel turns. Like, what, I think what, like, symbolized that really well was when Sandry brings out her first thread, and it has four knots in it, and they all put a piece of themselves in the knots. Yes. <laughs> it's so cute. Yeah. Ah. Very powerful. So, representation station. Toot, toot. <laughs> Let's just talk about, we get some good, like, POC representation, I feel like, in this book. I would agree. We have Daja, who's explicitly described as being black. Mm -hmm. Frostpine is also black. Mm -hmm. Briar is uh, also a character of color. He's, yeah. Um, and then Lark is as well. Mm -hmm. So that's, like, the main cast, and then Sandry, she's unfortunately white. <laughs> so is Triss. I think Miko is as well. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. So, like, I liked how not only are there characters of color, but when it's a white character, she explicitly says that they're white as well. Mm -hmm. Like, she describes their, like she describes everyone's skin tone, like as if it's just a part of their character, and I feel like that's very- I liked that, like, it was mm -hmm. like, this is just a part of every person, not, like, something mm -hmm. to be- I don't- you know what I mean. Yeah, and, like, and she also talked about how race isn't just completely- t like, it, it's not our view of how race is, like- yeah. Daja is black, but so is Frostpine, but they're different kinds of black, if that makes sense. Yeah, because I felt like... She's, Sorry. Because she's a traitor, and he is not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I feel like it isn't so much racism as just classism. <laughs> like, like yeah. Triss and Daja disagree with each other because Triss is a merchant and Daja is a traitor, not because Daja's mm -hmm. black and Triss is white. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's it. Yeah, it's one of those things where um, nationality is a in like class is more important than skin color. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah, which yeah. I mean, it it's not good. Like, it's not the ideal world, of course. No, it's not but, the ideal at all. But it's also, like, I think it is a good way to, like, take that... I don't mm-hmm. want to say, like, the emphasis off, off of race. It's more because, nuanced. It's more nuanced. Yeah, it just... Versus what we saw in the Immortal Quartet, where the only explicitly black character was a former slave. Oh, God. That was awful. Oh, my gosh. I just remember Tamara, that. Tamara has learned some lessons. Yeah. But, yeah, I really like that. And then we get more... Do, do you want me to spoil who's queer and who's not queer? No, not yet. Okay. I wanted to be a surprise. Yeah. Because I think only two of them are explicitly said on page. The other one learned on her Tumblr. (laughs) Nice. But, yeah, I don't know. That was pretty much the only thing that I could think of for representation. It's just that Mm -hmm. it was more... I also feel like that is good, like, world building. Because, like, Mm -hmm. it's not just our world and our social Mm -hmm. systems in a fantasy setting it's like it's actually different and yeah and also as well um despite like the white characters being white they didn't feel european if that makes sense yeah not feel european they didn't feel like our traditional like english european that we get a lot in like fantasy with like court drama stuff Mm -hmm. also what i think is was really interesting was Sandry's character how she you know grew up around all of these traders and merchants and like all these Mm -hmm. different kinds of people so she doesn't give a fuck because she knows everyone is just a person and wants to Mm -hmm. be friends with who she wants to be friends with and like appreciates other people's cultures like she straight up knows trader talk like yeah I just think that was I just thought that was so cool yeah. And then as well, I really liked um, the map for this. I, I think I like it better than the Tortal map. I didn't really get a good look at it, this book. I looked at the I looked at the one in Triss's book a little closer. Yeah. But... My ebook had one. Yeah. But yeah, I just really I, I really liked it it definitely feels like she has like her understanding of like, what is more appropriate to do? Granted, this was still written uh, over 20 years ago. But we see a lot... Uh, she's doing things better than modern-day writers do. <laughs> I would agree. I would definitely so, agree. It definitely feels like she definitely was um, told she needs to do better on certain things. And this is her doing better. Um, Which is yeah. definitely nice to see from a book that was legitimately published in the 90s. Pretty cool. Yeah. I feel like, yeah. I don't know, I do feel like fantasy, I feel like fantasy does representation better earlier, if, if that wasn't just a non-sentence, that was nothing, never mind. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, no, I understand what you mean, like, this was written, like, pre-Lord of the Rings movies. Yeah, that's crazy. I feel yeah. like that's, like, the oldest fantasy in the world. (laughs) I'm just kidding. No, it's not. Okay, so does this book hold up? Yeah, I would say. I would honestly say that it holds up pretty damn well. Like, like, more, I feel like, I almost have been starting to feel like we should put, does it hold up as like a subsection of representation station. (laughs) But like, or at least for fantasy books. But, like, yeah. any other book we've read that was published this long ago, which I suppose was only <laughs> the other Tamara Pierce books, <laughs> it holds up better than that, for sure. Like, this is better than, like, Cassandra Clare. Like, what was Cassandra Clare doing in her first few books? Uh, absolutely. Or, like, even last week, going back to Rick R- Riordan? Riordan? Riordan, Yeah. I mean, he wasn't doing so great in his first few books either, so. Yeah. there. Yeah, you can definitely see that she's been list- She's been going to cons. She's been talking to fans. Yeah. Then, yeah, so. Okay, Night and Living Author. Yeehaw! <laughs> That's literally all I wrote. <laughs> yeehaw. Yeehaw. I, I don't know. I, I was just really happy this book. 
I was too. It's just so... Like, I know shit is gonna hit the fan, but... Like, I'm sure. But this mm -hmm. book was such a good first book of a series, I thought. Like, mm -hmm. it sets everything up. Our characters get to know each other. They build relationships, even though they started from way different places. Mm -hmm. And I just... I guess, and there was, like, a little bit of conflict, like, there was conflict all throughout, obviously, but then, like, the, mm -hmm. the, what I think is gonna be, like, the big conflict of the series only came in, like, at the end, and, like, it was just so good. It was, like, a very mm -hmm. good first book of a series. Like, I think it set everything up so well. Yeah, I did not really have any gripes with this book at all. Maybe it was a little too short. Um, yeah. But it is, like, the first in, like, in a, a long book series, so it can be short, especially when I know how long some of the books end up being. Not in these four, right? I have Not in these four. They're all pretty thin. <laughs> um, also, yeah, I love, uh, I think that I like middle grade fiction so much because the books are so small they fit in my tiny little hands. <laughs> <laughs> They're the perfect size for my tiny little hands. <laughs> oh man! No, good yeah. job, good job, Tam, Tammy, Tam Tamara Pierce. You did it this time, and there's like no weird like <laughs> situations oh, my going thank on. Thank God, I was so nervous. Oh, I, <laughs> I was like, if I am, if I go through this whole book thinking how loving how pure and great these relationships are to find out there's a Dane and Nuke Mare sitch. I'm gonna <laughs> flip my lid, dude. Oh, man. No, no uh, the ones, uh, only one of the four end up getting a love interest. Who okay. In, uh, the love interest is, in fact, age-appropriate. Thank God. Oh, I can read easy now. Yeah. Yeah, she wasn't bringing her kinks into this. <laughs> oh, yeah. man. So, rate that book. I'm going to give it a solid nine. I'm going to give it a nine, too. So yeah, good. I like, felt... it was like cottagecore mixed with, uh -huh. like, like, it was just, it was kind of that, I don't know, I saw it going around, like, book Twitter a couple months ago, but just, like, a slow magic or like a slow mm -hmm. fantasy if that makes mm -hmm. sense where it's like very just wholesome and like there's not a lot of action and a war or rebellion it's just like mm -hmm. a cute little magic system you know where people live in it <laughs> yeah and this is why I, I often get annoyed that like when you say Tamara Pierce, people only think of the Alana books, which is why we haven't read them because the Alana books kind of suck in comparison to the rest of her books. I said it there. <laughs> I said it. <laughs> like, I personally don't care for the Alana books. Um, I think the Circle books are so much better. And then also you get the bonus of the fact that the Circle books were all of them were published under Scholastic. So there's not like the weird stuff that was going on with all the Tortal books. Right. But yeah, yeah. I, I, I really like it. And then also I really enjoy that we get to see her interact with like different cultures as the basis for stuff mm -hmm. in in the uh, the circle books. We get more uh, Middle Eastern and uh, more like Southern European yeah. influences. We get more um, Asian influences. There are some Asian influences in the Tortal books, but like not until the Kell books with the cop with the um, I forget whatever aisles and like the Copper Isles. But th this one I feel like is a better mash of like different like cultures and also because of the way that the temples work is that you have people from different cultures all living together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it is. Very, very good. Very, very good. Yeah. And then I, I, I'm, I'm excited to, for us to enter again with how the religion in uh, the in the circle books works. Because it's wildly different than how the religion is in the Tortal books. Because in the Tortal books, it's like a whole, like, Perinthian of gods. Mm -hmm. Well, this one is more of your classical, um, like, 
temples gods. Okay. Like, there's still, like, um, there's still, like, a whole, like, Porinthian of gods to work with, but it's a little more, how do I say this? It's, it's a li- it's not as, like, like, Greek inspired. That's, like, the only way I can explain <laughs> it. Because, like, you, we see characters who are obviously influenced by our, our, ver- our version, our world's, uh, Islam. We see that in the books, but, like, a fantasy version of Islam. It's very interesting. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. We see women who wear wear the veil and are veiled in these books. And it's not, like, weird like it is in the Tortal books. Gotcha. Very nice. So, yeah. So, how believable was the magic? It was so good. It is so good. And, like, especially when I was just listening to the audiobook and not reading it, it did get mm-hmm. a little... Like, it was confusing at parts for me to visualize what was happening mm-hmm. with the characters and their magic. But, like, mm-hmm. I didn't give a fuck. Like, I knew what was going on. And I could, mm-hmm. like, I could put the put the pieces in my mind, but, like, I couldn't connect mm-hmm. them, if that makes sense. Like, I knew what was going on, but I couldn't, like, perfectly picture mm-hmm. it. But that was, like, completely fine for me. Uh, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I thought it was very good. A little confusing, mm-hmm. but I, I didn't care. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, another thing I was just thinking about is, like, I feel... Not to just keep talking about the Tortal books, but those are the only other books by her that we've read on the podcast. Is I feel like the Tortal books are, like, classic high fantasy yeah. of, like... When you are when you think about Dungeons and Dragons, you think that's what it's going to be. While the Circle of Magic books are what actually playing Dungeons and Dragons is like. It's a little <laughs> more rough around the edges. It's a little more homespun. That's describing it. It's a little more homespun. Yeah. Yeah. Versus like the, oh, here is our um, university magic. Yeah. But, <laughs> or like, yeah. it's just, it's less like... Maybe it's, like, less, like, court politics, maybe. Yeah. There's none of that, at least so far, which I definitely enjoy because it's definitely a change of pace for fantasy, so. Yeah. We do get that later on, like, much later on in the books because, you know, Sandry literally is a noble woman. <laughs> right. But I think that I'll get enough good good magic fantasy in books. there yeah. before then. <laughs> yeah, will we let our middle school selves read this book? This is a very age appropriate book for middle schoolers to read. Yes, absolutely. Like very good. Like you're reading about kids being kids. There's no cursing. The way they t- the where they're just like sometimes they hear about sex. And you're just like, <gasps> <gasps> <laughs> or like Briar said the breast. <gasps> <laughs> I feel like this would, I feel like even it would be good for kids younger than middle school if, like, someone was reading it to them, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because, like, I think it's a good example of, like, class systems and, like, it's a good way, it would Mm -hmm. be a good way to teach that in a fun way that is age appropriate, so. Uh Uh-huh. Definitely. Definitely would let my middle school self-read it. Yeah, these are really good. I once again, I wish Tamara Pierce was more hyped, more hyped. I agree. Um, yeah. So that was Sandry's book. Next week we'll be reading book two, which I think is Triss's book. Yes. Yeah, we'll be reading Triss's book, which is book two in the Circle of Magic Quartet. And then um, you know where to find us on social media. Our intro and outro music is Distant Thunder Sunday Mornings by Springtide off the album This Is the End. Um, if you also don't know where to find us on social media, uh, you can just look up We Majored in English for this on Twitter. We have a Facebook. We have an Instagram. Haley makes beautiful graphics every week. Go check them out. Thank you. Um, sometimes we post stuff on Tumblr. Not often. Uh, you can follow me personally at kjane0696 on, um, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Haley is still, um, on her social media hiatus, so you will not find her. I occasionally (laughs) post on Instagram. S R O Y N zero M. I post. I've just been posting just goofy shit. So, yeah. You, Haley, Haley is only interactive with social media. Is <laughs> running the social media for this podcast. I also. I'm gonna start putting the episodes on YouTube again because I okay. think that's a good okay. idea. So. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, catch y'all on the flip. Goodbye. Bye.